Hello friends, welcome to a session of uh, nervous system. We are discussing cerebral vascular uh, diseases. We already seen what is cerebral infarct, what is uh, transient ischemic attack or what is small vessel infarct. Now we will see what is uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So when patient came with hemiplegia, it, it's very difficult to differentiate clinically whether patient is having a hemorrhage or infarct. So, uh, so for initial work of stroke, it is better to do CT scan and then we need to decide whether to that whether, whether to uh, thrombolize that patient or not. So the uh, most of the patient, we can say 70 to 80 percent patient may have uh, infarct and which may require uh, thrombolysis and the remaining part that is 15 to 20 percent of a uh, patient may be having hemorrhage and hemorrhage can be uh, it can be in uh, hypertensive hemorrhage it can be bleed in the tumors it can be because of some underlying coagulopathy or even it can be because of subarachnoid hemorrhage so accordingly the management will uh, differ in this session we will consider uh, the uh, intracranial hemorrhage which is associated with uh, or which is which is a spontaneous hemorrhage will not deal with a traumatic bleed and the, the traumatic bleed can present with subdural or epidural uh, hemorrhage or, or even in some cases subarachnoid hemorrhage so today's discussion will be more focused on spontaneous bleed so it may be uh, it hypertensive bleed or subarachnoid hemorrhage and in general, what will what should be the management when patient uh, present with intracranial uh, bleed? So as I told you, the uh, causes of uh, bleed, IC bleed, the commonest being hypertensive hemorrhage. It may be because of head injury, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It may be because of drugs like cocaine or amphetamine, uh, anticoagulant therapy. So anticoagulant therapy is also one of the uh, very uh, common risk factor uh, because most of the patient. Uh, who are having uh, a DVT or pulmonary embolism, those patients we put them on warfarin or acetrome or vitamin K antagonist and some patients go on taking warfarin without monitoring PT INR or because of some diet modification the uh, INR may uh, vary and it may uh, touch up to a higher range of uh, INR and those patients are at risk of uh, bleed. So the uh, monitoring of INR is very important uh, for patients who are taking uh, warfarin or uh, vitamin K antagonist. Regarding coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia, there are many diseases which can present with uh, thrombocytopenia or, and coagulopathy and it may be a cause of intracranial bleed. Again, a brain tumor. Some patient may be old age, those patients uh, complain of headache maybe starting from last uh, six months and they may neglect that headache but uh, hemorrhage in the that tumor that patient may directly present uh, to us with stroke and even the brain tumor can be a cause of hemorrhage. So coming to a clinical features as it's not easy to differentiate as I told you it's not easy to differentiate between hemorrhagic and ischemic uh, uh, stroke but the, uh, the usual scenario is that in in fact the maximum damage is at, at the start of stroke. So in embolic stroke or in thrombotic stroke the neurological deficit will be maximum at start and uh, embolic, embolic stroke will start improving immediately after uh, that initial stroke. But in hemorrhagic stroke, the hemorrhagic stroke there will be a maximum damage, uh, there will be a damage at initial part of stroke but even that damage may, may worsen in next 30 to 90 minutes because the cause may be hypertensive. So patients start with, uh, start with symptom when there is we can say mild amount of hemorrhage and that hemorrhage may continue if we, are, we fail to control uh, blood pressure. So the hemorrhagic stroke ideally go on worsening uh, within next, to, next 30 to 90 minutes. So this is uh, very important if you take a proper history and uh, clinically in some cases you can fairly say okay, this may be a case of uh, hemorrhagic stroke. The next uh, clinical symptom will be diminished level of consciousness. So we can see it ischemic as well as hemorrhagic stroke. Next will be signs of increased intracranial pressure. So as our cranium is a, a closed compartment, the excess bleed may present with signs of uh, intracranial uh, pressure, intracranial uh, increased IC pressure. And the commonest symptom being headache, vomiting or in some cases uh, a seizure. But classically, uh, seizures are not so common in intracranial hemorrhage. 
So scissors, we can say it is commoner in venous sinus thrombosis or venous sinus thrombosis associated with a bleed. So scissor uh, is more commonly seen in venous infarct or venous hemorrhage. So the, the presentation will differ on what is the site of bleed and the commonest site of, as I told you, the commonest cause of ice bleed is hypertension. Uh, other than uh, trauma, definitely in, uh, in, in era of uh, road traffic accident, trauma is the commonest cause for bleed. But uh, after that, the hypertension is a common cause to present as a hemorrhagic stroke. And if that uh, uh, bleed is in putame, here you have MCQ, what is the commonest cause of IC uh, hypertensive bleed? So your answer should be putamen. Putamen is the commonest uh, site where you will see uh, a hypertensive bleed. And such a patient will present with contralateral hemiparesis and slur speech. Contralateral hemiparesis because of involvement of your uh, pyramidal tract and slur speech is because of your uh, involvement of upper motor neuron palsy of facial nerve. So contralateral plagia or hemiparesis and slur speech. And if you do a CT scan, you will see a nicely hemorrhage in the putamen. So you, you need to remember that putamen is, putamen is the most common site for hypertensive hemorrhage. And this is the commonest MCQ asked in uh, your exam uh, when, when considering IC bleed or, or IC hemorrhage. So the bleed may be, may be in putamen or in the uh, thalamic area. There is involvement of thalamus. As we know, thalamin, thalamus is more uh, related to your pain or uh, sensation. Patients with thalamic hemorrhage later may present with chronic and contralateral pain syndrome. So thalamic hemorrhage, in, uh, after a few, uh, few weeks, we can say he may start complaining of contralateral pain syndrome. And it is classically called as Dejerine's Rossi syndrome. So this is again your uh, MCQ point. Coming to a pontine hemorrhage, so a pons, a part of brainstem, it's a compact uh, a part of brain and when there is a bleed in uh, pontine area, so obviously you will expect more neurodeficit. So patient will have a quadriplegia. Quadriplegic patient with, uh, uh, we can say patient may have a pinpoint pupil. So classical sign of a pontine bleed is pinpoint pupil. So here you have a MCQ, the, uh, if, you are, if you have a, a MCQ like what is the cause for pinpoint pupil and if you have option of pontine hemorrhage, so you should tick on pontine hemorrhage. And uh, you may be knowing what is pinpoint pupil. Pinpoint pupil classically is defined as a 1 mm size of pupil. And these pupils will be reacting to light. Uh, reacting to light and size will be around 1 mm. So that will be a pinpoint pupil and you should immediately uh, think that you should immediately uh, uh, you should immediately think that this patient might be uh, having pontine hemorrhage. Because of involvement of reticular system, this patient will have deep coma and decerebrate rigidity. Coming to a laboratory and imaging evaluation, as I told you in a uh, initial workup of stroke, you need to do CT scan because we have a treatment for infarct in the, in the form of uh, thrombolysis, but you cannot give thrombolysis to hemorrhagic patient. So we need to rule out hemorrhage and if you give thrombolysis to hemorrhagic patient without looking at CT scan, that those patients may worsen. So CT scan and yes, you have a MCQ here. CT scan is more sensitive than MRI when considering bleed. CT scan is more sensitive for bleed compared to MRI. And MRI is definitely, if you have an option, if there is a patient present with uh, after window period, that is we can say after four, four and a half hour or six hour, you uh, rather than doing CT scan, you can directly go for MRI, which will give more information than CT scan. So coming to a treatment, so this patient most of the time present with high blood pressure and your target of treatment will be controlling that blood pressure. Just maintain systolic blood pressure less than 180 mm of Hg. So you may need not target 120 mm of Hg of systolic blood pressure. Your target should be at around 180 mm of Hg. So mean arterial pressure will come to less than 130 mm of Hg. And for controlling blood pressure, you should avoid uh, NTG that is uh, trinitrate glycerin. 
which is a drug of choice for uh, hypertension which is related to cardiac causes so just avoid ntg uh, and your preferred drug should be labetalol or uh, nicardipine or ismolol so labetalol nicardipine and ismolol this should be your choice of drug while treating hypertensive bleed rather than giving ntg as we discussed already patient will have uh, increased intracranial pressure so we have option of uh, option of mannitol or hyperventilation mannitol and hyperventilation will uh, decrease ic bleed and uh, before going for any surgical intervention this hyperventilation will hardly work for 24 hour so hyperventilation cannot be a definitive treatment for decrease uh, intracranial pressure it's just a backup for your uh, further plan uh, in most of the cases if there is a cerebral hemorrhage uh, we need to do surgical evaluation so coming to a surgical evaluation so you need to uh, just remember uh, one point uh, here if the bleed is supratentorial if bleed, bleed is supratentorial you may not go for surgical uh, evacuation but if the bleed is infratentorial because infratentorial contains cere cerebellum and brainstem which is a, a dense uh, tissue uh, which involves vital centers like uh, respiratory center or cardiac center so when there is infratentorial bleed you need to uh, uh, call neurosurgeon immediately and he may advise imme immediate uh, surgical evacuation in the form of craniotomy and if that bleed is more than 3 cm, I think even you can directly ask neurosurgeon for uh, surgical evacu evacuation. So it was a discussion regarding uh, intracerebral bleed. We have considered what is hypertensive bleed. Now a spontaneous bleed, in spontaneous bleed, other commonest cause of IC bleed is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you should not uh, uh, confuse the bleed start from epidural, subdural, which is with the commonest cause of epidural and subdural uh, bleed is uh, a trauma followed by subarachnoid hemorrhage and then intracerebral bleed and intraventricular bleed according to site of bleed the name will change that if it is uh, uh, outside of your dura matter we will label it as epidural if it's uh, uh, under the dura matter we can label it as a subdural epidural subdural subarachnoid intracerebral or intraparenchymal and uh, intraventricular bleed so here subarachnoid hemorrhage so, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, as you know most of the uh, intracranial vessels are in subarachnoid space like ranging from your uh, middle cerebral artery or anterior cerebral artery or posterior cerebral artery these arteries are in subarachnoid space and any damage or any perforation to uh, those arteries may be start from aneurysm and those aneurysm may rupture and will directly present as a subarachnoid hemorrhage so you have mcq here what is the most common cause for subarachnoid hemorrhage so your answer should be rupture of sacular aneurysm that is berry berry aneurysm so again this mcq this point has been focused uh, multiple times in MCQ exams. So, rupture of sacular aneurysm is the most common cause for subarachnoid hemorrhage after trauma because trauma is definitely first cause when considering road traffic accident. When we are considering spontaneous bleed, our answer should be sacular aneurysm or berry aneurysm. And the commonest location. So, again, next common MCQ asked regarding subarachnoid hemorrhage is what is the commonest site for subarachnoid hemorrhage? So your answer should be, it may be a terminal part of internal carotid arteries. Terminal part of internal carotid arteries, maybe anterior cerebral arteries. And it may be a, a, a site at MCA bifurcation or top of the basal arteries. Uh, your uh, terminal internal carotid artery, MCA bifurcation and top of the basal artery. Uh, these are the commonest location uh, where you will see subarachnoid hemorrhage. I want to include aneurysm of anterior cerebral artery in in commonest location of subarachnoid hemorrhage so if you have option of aneurysm of anterior cerebral artery you may tick it as a commonest cause of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage so it's again a terminal internal carotid uh, artery coming to uh, clinical features uh, being a bleed patient make may give a history or patient patient or patients relative may give history of excruciating thunderclap headache 
severe headache he might not experience that he- headache uh, previously in his life so experiencing a headache followed by neuro deficit or sudden loss of consciousness so your first differential diagnosis should be subarachnoid hemorrhage and if try to check clinical features patient may be may be comatose patient may be in a loss of conscious state and if you check neck stiffness there will be neck stiffness positive so it indicates meningeal irritation so that bleed that bleed as i told you is in the subarachnoid hemorrhage and the other substance which is present in subarachnoid hemorrhage is csf cerebrospinal fluid so you will get blood in the cerebrospinal fluid and as that uh, blood will uh, blood will moving around the course of uh, csf that blood will irritate meninges and uh, when you check neck stiffness patient will have uh, that positive neck stiffness and the bed side beautiful bed side test for diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage when your clinical suspicion is very high you just need to do lumbar puncture test in a set of where ct scan is not available but if there is if there is availability of ct scan better go for ct scan or imaging uh, but when there is no uh, no availability of uh, ct scan uh, just do a lp and if you find a uh, blur in uh, csf Uh, your diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, will be confirmed uh, here we have a uh, three four important points clinically interested as well as your mcq point of view some patient of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage so patient may not present with subarachnoid hemorrhage so uh, uh, patient may be having aneurysm aneurysm of at the junction of pca and ica that is posterior cerebral artery and internal carotid artery at the junction of posterior cerebral artery and internal carotid artery if there is an aneurysm aneurysm at that junction so that aneurysm may lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage if if it's not treated at that at, at proper time because of vicinity of third nerve patient may present with third nerve palsy so before presenting as a subarachnoid hemorrhage this patient uh, may come to you as a third nerve palsy maybe tosis or uh, uh, people is not reacting to light so a uh, patients who, who present with a uh, uh, third nerve palsy you need to think of aneurysm and uh, and that patient may uh, soon soon develop subarachnoid hemorrhage so this is very imp- important point you have a ask mcq as if if the aneurysm is at the junction of pca and ica patient will present as so your answer should be third nerve canal palsy so similar thing uh, thing happen when there is a uh, aneurysm in cavernous sinus so cavernous sinus is again associated closely associated with sixth nerve so patient will have a sixth nerve that is abduction palsy and patient will have lateral gaze palsy so again th- that patient before presenting as a subarachnoid hemorrhage he may present with six nerve clinical features of six nerve palsy again some patient may present with visual field defect when there is expanding supraclinoid carotid and uh, anterior cerebral artery aneurysm so here again you have a mcq aneurysm at posterior uh, posterior inferior cerebral artery that is pica or ica means anterior inferior cerebral artery aneurysm Uh, of this artery may present with occipital and posterior cervical pain if those patients are not responding to your, your regular treatment you have done all work up for uh, headache so you may need to go for angiography which will uh, definitely show aneurysm of uh, pica and anterior inferior cerebral artery they can present as occipital and posterior cervical pain coming to a complication as such subarachnoid hemorrhage itself is a complication for aneurysm but those patient may deteriorate further because of free bleed re rupture of that aneurysm or patient may develop hyponatremia or patient may have hydrocephalus or vasospasm so hydrocephalus again as uh, that that blur will be in subarachnoid space along with csf and that blur will move along csf uh, that rbcs or lyse product of blood will block a normal uh, channel of uh, csf circulation and so those patient may present with hydrocephalus and uh, over a period of time the clinical condition of that patient will deteriorate so th- this may be a complication and second thing vasospasm vasospasm it's basically protective phenomenon of our body to control bleed uh, from aneurysm so the artery which is prior to that aneurysm will have vasospasm 
and this vasospasm itself may be a complication which will lead to ischemia or infarct to area which is supplied by that specific artery. So vasospasm should need to take care. So coming to a diagnosis, as I told you, the diagnosis we can do it with the help of uh, lumbar puncture and you will see blood in the CSF and non contrasted scan will definitely throw on your diagnosis. Coming to management, we have a two option that is surgical management which is, will be a definitive management and medical management. Medical management, we need to uh, do it earlier in the course of SH and uh, as the availability of neurosurgeon, you can go for clipping or coiling. Clipping can be done by neurosurgery, coiling may be done by interventional neurologist. Coming to medical uh, management, the blood pressure monitoring is uh, very important because high blood pressure will increase uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and low blood pressure with the help of vasospasm will lead to infarct. So the blood pressure monitoring is very important followed by management of vasospasm and treatment of hydrocephalus. So hydrocephalus, so we may need to do ventricular stomy and in most of the time it's very difficult to uh, gauge what is the intracranial pressure so you, you need to do uh, ventricular stomy to measure the intracranial pressure and uh, accordingly we can lower blood pressure to normal using nicardipine, labetalol and ismolol to maintain adequate cerebral perfusion you need to target cerebral perfusion pressure to 60 to 70 mm of Hg so cerebral perfusion pressure which can be calculated with the help of systemic pressure and intracranial pressure so difference between intracranial pressure and systemic pressure will decide what is what will be the cerebral perfusion pressure so cerebral perfusion pressure we need to target it at 60 to 70 mm of Hg as i told you vasospasm is again dangerous complication and the beautiful drug we have in the form of nimodipine we need to give it 60 mg four times in a day will take care of vasospasm next uh, we can say old type of the therapy that is triple h therapy so triple h h 3 h indicates hypertension hemodilution and hypervolemic treatment so hypertension as we have a logic that if there is a decrease pressure in that specific artery that that artery will give rise to infarct so we need to give uh, pressure support by giving pressure drugs or inotropes in the form of your dopamine or noradrenaline so hypertension in some cases you need to induce uh, pressure and in some cases you need to control uh, blood pressure second thing is hemodilution so hemodilution you need to give more uh, fluid therapy to decrease thrombotic complication and again hypervolemic treatment will again in the form of giving maximum IV fluid it will form a triple H therapy that is hypertension, hemodilution and hypervolemic treatment so for giving this triple H therapy you need to monitor IC bleed as well as systemic blood pressure as well as central venous uh, pressure that is CVP CVP will guide you how much fluid you need to give a ventriculostomy or IC pressure a measurement will guide you what should be our uh, uh, ideal blood pressure. Uh, next and common management for bedridden patient is prevention of pulmonary embolism and here because of difficulty of uh, IC bleed we have option of uh, preventing pulmonary embolism by giving pneumatic compression stocking.